Hello, and today we're going to do the experiment and do some spectroscopy. More spectroscopy this weekend too. We're doing spectroscopy all the time. We're going to do the determination of the Rydberg constant for the hydrogen atom. And we're going to do that with a half meter grading spectrometer. Yes, it looks like a big black box. We'll tell you what's in the black box in a moment. In addition to that, we've got a hydrogen lamp. If you take a look in there, and I can, ooh, we've got, this is the cool room. We can turn off the lights. There it is. It's sort of a pink, purple light that we get out of the hydrogen lamp, right? We've got the, the variable lights here. See, you're really doing spectroscopy when you do it in the dark, right? Spectroscopists work in the dark. You want to avoid scattered light is one of the things, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to create light from a hydrogen source. So you have H2, you put it in a discharge, blow it apart. Hydrogen atoms are formed. They're formed in excited electronic states. They emit light. We're going to look at that light, right? We're going to use this big black box to do it, spectrometer, right? How does the spectrometer work? Well, what we've got here in our big black box, we've got the lamp. And then if you look down here, you can see two, what they are is micrometers, right? And we're going to adjust those micrometers here and here on the entrance slit and before our detector. The detector is a photomultiplier tube, a PMT. That's what I'll call it, right? Photomultiplier tube. So what do we got? We got some lovely drawings here from my daughter, who's the artist in the family, right? Gets that from her mother. I can't draw for anything, as you shall soon see. So what's the big black box? We got a big black box. That's our half meter spectrometer, right? We've got a light source. That's our hydrogen atom discharge lamp. And we've got a photomultiplier tube, TMT, photomultiplier tube. That's our detector, right? So we need to cut a hole in the box to get light in. And we need to cut a <laughs> hole in the box to get light out to our detector, all right? Uh, we're going to detect the light. The photomultiplier tube is basically a, it's a sheet of metal that's covered with a low war function metal, sodium, potassium, something like that, cesium, right? And when electrons hit it or uh, photons hit it, they get absorbed. You create a photoelectron. You're going to detect the current of photoelectrons. But importantly, we've got more than one plate. We're going to accelerate those photoelectrons into another plate. Boom, more electrons get generated more current gets generated. So we have a variable gain, right? Gain, right? Amplification factor that's proportional to the voltage that we put on the PMT. So we can change the gain by changing the voltage, all right? Now we need, so that's how we detect intensity, but we wanna know the wavelength of light. How do we get to know the wavelength of light? We do that by defining the path through the spectrometer Right? We need to define the path of the photons and we want to somehow make it so that only at one particular wavelength gets to our detector. So first of all, we want to define the path. And the way we do that is we put slits in here, variable slits on the micrometers that I showed you over there, right? We turn those uh, micrometers and we can move, basically have two razor blades that come closer together. And when they get closer together, they better define the path, right? Only certain angles can get through here and get out of here. So we define the path better, right? But if you make the slit smaller and define the path better, right? When you define the path better, we'll see our resolution gets better. But if you define the path better by making this fewer photons get in. The intensity goes down and proving my point once again that spectroscopy is a trade-off between signal to noise that's the right way signal to noise right resolution right better defining the path better defines the wavelength higher resolution less signal right and patience If you have less signal, you can average for longer, do a longer experiment and, and get better signal to noise, right? Ah, okay, so we always have to trade off between the three of those. You can see the trade off here. You make a smaller slit, you get less light through lower signal, but you get higher resolution. Now we're gonna have to play around with it. 
but still, how do I get light from there to here? Uh, I don't know. And variable, know when it is. Okay, so we need a couple more off blowers. One is a lens. We put a lens in there, and then we put a, a mirror over here, but that mirror is a focusing mirror. Where is it going to focus the light? It's going to focus the light onto a grating, right? The grating has slits on it, all right, that define the grating. And we can move this grating. So let's say it's got some wheels on it. We can move the grating, change the angle on it, right? So light's coming in this way. Right, we define where it can go, and it's going to focus down in there. We're going to fill this thing up, right? Okay, and then this is going to focus light back onto our grating. We're going to try to totally fill the grating, boom, like that. And then as we turn the grating, only a certain wavelength of light. We'll hit, we have a second mirror over here, focusing mirror, and only a particular wavelength will bounce off of that and be focused onto our slit, get through the variable slit, right, and be detected at the PMT, right? So we define the path with our slits and with the diffraction grading so that only one wavelength at a time knows, uh, goes into our detector and we know what wavelength that is because we know the angle at which the detector is. We put the detector or um, the diffraction grating, excuse me, we put that on a stepper motor so that we can turn the angle and we know exactly which wavelength is getting to our detector. All right, good. So now what are we gonna do? Now it is the strategy of spectroscopy. So strategy of spectroscopy is turn out the lights, Right? Why turn out the lights? To minimize scattered light so that only light from our uh, light source, the lamp, gets into our detector. It's just cooler when you do spectroscopy in the dark, too. Then what we're going to do? Well, what we do is modify the procedure a little bit. We're going to turn up the voltage, right? There's a voltage that we can adjust here, right? There's a voltage adjustment and a baseline adjustment, right? We're going to change the voltage to about 700 volts. It says 900. We're going to make it 700. That's a better number, right? 700 volts there. And I've adjusted the baseline so that the signal, the zero is actually at minus 5 volts. And so we're trying to get this to move from about minus 5 volts to plus 5 volts. It's got that range, all right? What do we want to do? I'm nice to you. I tell you where the most intense strongest peak of hydrogen is, you're gonna go over that at very high resolution and make sure, right? So we're gonna scan, and it tells us to scan from 656 nanometers to 657 nanometers. You're gonna do that with a really small step size, right? So we get high resolution, so we can define where the peak is well. Then we have a dwell time at each, it's a stepper motor, right? Boom, grading here, step. We dwell there for a while, average our signal from the PMT, then boom, step again averages signal again and each one of those averaging points where we dwell right is an intensity point that we're going to measure and plot out as our spectrum so we can change the step size smaller step size higher resolution more steps longer to take the spectrum and then we have the dwell time at each step longer waiting time better signal to noise but it takes longer to take the whole spectrum. So I give you, this is gonna be the high resolution one. It's really narrow step size, long dwell time, but we're only gonna run through it once from uh, 656 nanometers to 657 nanometers, boom. Oh, we get this huge peak and there, the peak is too big, right? It's saturated, it's flat on the top. We don't want saturated peaks, you can't have saturated peaks. How do we turn down the intensity? We change the slit size. That will also narrow the slit size, not only reduces intensity, but will help us define a resolution. So let's narrow down. I've already positioned the lamp, right? I moved the lamp back and forth and I centered it on the one slit. And I moved, I turned that slit down to be just barely open, okay? So that I've already done. That takes a little while, playing around and find the center. And, and some 
uh, you, you go to the center of this uh, peak, the software actually lets you tell uh, set the wavelength at which the grating sits. And you can sit there and measure the intensity on the uh, PMT. There's a little bar graph, right? And you move things around and you see exactly where it is. Boom! You center the light source on there. And then I, I turn that down. Now what I'm going to do is turn down the slit size in front of the PMT, run the spectrum again. I made it a little bit smaller, so hopefully this time, oh no, it's still saturated. Still saturated, what that means is I have to change this slit size. And I'm moving it just a couple of microns. I'm getting it to be, try to make it open by only a few microns. And now we run it again. Oh, oh, we got a real peak this time. Okay, hopefully, because, oh, it's a really light one. But this time, the top of the peak is only going here. It's, you actually see shape to it. It's not going all the way up. It's no longer saturated. Fantastic. So now, on the most intense peak, at 700 volts, I'm not saturated anymore. So I can go over the area of the spectrum where we have intense peaks, and I know nothing is going to saturate. All right? Now, the problem is, is that in the visible, there are very few peaks. So what are we gonna do? You know the strategy, right, of spectroscopy. We take a survey scan. A survey scan has a big step size, right? But a small dwell time so that it's fast. And then you'll find where the peak is. Note that down in your notebook and you'll return to a small wavelength region, plus or minus a nanometer from where you think the center was from that survey scan, and you'll go over it in high resolution, just like we did this peak, to find the center of the peak with good signal to noise. So through the, uh, through the visible, we've got to do that. Now, once you get out to the end of the UV, right? The peaks start to get closer together, all right? And um, then you're able to find more than one peak. Let me just run this down to, I'm going to do one of these survey scans. So a bigger step size, 0.018 uh, nanometers of the step size, a dwell time of two. So not nearly as long as what we had on that last one. I'm going to run a quick survey. Now, in the visible, there are very few peaks, right? So we run this survey scan, and we can only do that in uh, 30 nanometer regions, all right? Why is this? Well, it turns out that this software can only accept so many data points in any one file. So we can't just scan the entire visible because there would be too many data points. So we have to do it chunk by chunk, right? If you have a, a big step size, then you can get 30 nanometers. When we go at high resolution, you can't do more than about 11 or 12 nanometers. So we're going to break that down out in the UV into 11 nanometer chunks, right? So you have to play around with this again, right? You would like to be able to just do everything at high resolution and, you know, the biggest wavelength scan possible, but you can't always do that. You got to work with how many data points is that, right? You can turn into millions and millions of data points and sometimes your software can't handle that. So for a survey scan, we can do about 30 nanometers at low resolution, right? You'll find the individual peaks and then you go over the individual peaks at high resolution. Then when we finally get out in the UV, their peaks are dense enough, right? They're close enough together that you can do an 11 nanometer scan and still likely hit one or more peak in that. So we'll run that region at high resolution. Okay, now the problem that we're gonna run into is over here in the red, right, the peaks are huge and then they rapidly lose intensity through the UV and the, uh, uh, through the visible and then out in the UV, they're really small. So here's at the same, oops, wrong computer. Hey, I've got my new computer right here. Woohoo! Yay. Okay. So you can see here is on the same scale as what we had that other peak, right? That's all the bigger these are. All right. 
So we hit, there they are. Oh, okay. So these guys, all right, they are super small compared to what we had before. Can you see this? There we go. Now you can see these. Oh, and they're even more than one peak. So there's a nice big peak there. Then it's getting smaller, smaller yet, and way small. But you see this intensity pattern, right? It's really easy to pick out the peaks that you need. And what about these guys down here? I mean, for these big peaks, right? Boom, no problem there. That's our real peak. Now I would want to go over this at high resolution, get a lot of points. You have to get, I mean, if you get five or seven points on a, you can define a peak, but you haven't really defined the peak center all that well, right? Um, so what we'd like to do is get, you know, 10, 20 points across it, and then you can fit this peak to uh, a Lorentzian function and um, really find the center of it very well. I'll show you how to do that in Igor in a moment. But what about wee tiny little peaks like these? Are these real peaks? Look at the size of these guys. Now, those are awful, right? And the noise is almost the same size as the peak. And they're only on some of these two or three points, five points across them. Are they really well defined? For better definition of the peaks, we need more averaging. And there are two ways to increase your averaging. One is to increase the dwell time, right? These were on short dwell time. So I'm at each point, you sit there for a while and you just collect signal, right? So you can increase that uh, dwell time and that increases your averaging and increases your signal. Okay, that's one way to do better signal averaging. The other way to increase your signal to noise ratio is because we're on a stepper motor, that grading is on a stepper motor, we know exactly where it is. Okay, so we can go back to the beginning of the scan, boom, and know exactly what the wavelength is, and then scan again. And so we can do multiple scans of the same wavelength region, add them together, and average those. You get much better signal to noise. That really, really helps. There's only so much you can do with dwell time. And then averaging scans together really helps. So what we'll do out in this region where the peaks are really small, right, is that we'll go over those regions at high resolution 10 times, add them together, and then we'll get a much better signal to noise. And these little guys here, we'll pick those out in even much smaller ones because that baseline is really going to go down to just about no noise at all, right? What else can we do? Whoa. When the signal gets really small out here, we can crank up the voltage, right? So out in the UV range through the visible, we'll use you never, ever, ever change the slits again, right? Because the slits have set your resolution. You want the resolution to be the same throughout all of the data acquisition. But you can change the voltage on the spectrometer, right? And if you turn that up, you can get more signal higher gain with higher voltage, right? And you do that out in the UV, you're gonna turn it up out there to uh, 1,050 volts, and that way we'll be able to extract signal from way out in the UV as well. All right, so let me just make sure we've got everything right. We're gonna scan through that whole region. Um, survey scans and then high resolution scans turning up the, the uh, PMT voltage in the UV for better signal to noise, right? Higher gain. You got to play around with those tricks. I've given you the, the uh, parameters that work best. It took some experimenting, of course, to figure out what's the best dwelling time, how many um, times could you repeat. Now, if you had more time than a four-hour experiment, you could go to 10, 20, 50, 100 times if you really needed that extra averaging for better signal to noise. This is about as high resolution as you can go. The step size is actually as small as you can get with the grading that we have. So that's the ultimate resolution already right there. Okay, so I believe we have covered everything.